the beginning, there was Metroid. And it was good. And then, there was Super Metroid. And it was awesome. Then, some other stuff happened. And it really wasn't very good. More just kind of meh, really. And in time, the awesome was all but forgotten. Not by everyone. One developer worked alone for five years on a project that he believed would allow the world to live again the awesome that was. Did he succeed? To find out, let's play Axiom Verge. This is Axiom Verge, which was released in 2015 for PS4 and Steam, and subsequently has been released for pretty much every console platform, as far as I'm aware. Uh, it's from Thomas Hap Games, which as far as I know is basically just Thomas Hap. Uh, it's an unusual game insofar as Everything, basically, programming, art, level design, music, was the work of a single developer. Uh, those are disparate enough skills these days that it's fairly impressive that a single person can do all of those pretty competently. Uh, the game, as you can probably tell from the title screen here, is a retro Metroidvania. A retro meaning that it's in the style of 8-bit and 16-bit games. Uh, Metroidvania meaning that it's an open-world 2D platformer in the style of Metroid and Castlevania being the genre-defining games. Uh, I'll just go through the menu a little bit here. Uh, options give us configuration. It does work with either keyboard or gamepad. Uh, interesting to note that some of the key options on here are hidden before you get the items they actually control. Nice touch. Uh, pretty much all the usual stuff you would see in graphics options. Nothing too exciting there. Uh, there are a couple of ways of selecting weapons, either linear or ring. I've not tried linear style, I don't know how well it works. I just use ring style. I guess it has a few different language options, too. Obviously, I'm using English in my case. Uh, another interesting thing about the game that you can see on the menu here is it does have built-in support for speedrun timing. Basically, this just runs through the game, overlays some boss milestones on it with the time you reach them. Uh, it also, I think gives you a predefined seed, so the events of the game are predictable, so you can game them as you need to. I think mainly health drops are the thing that's affected. Uh, this is actually a separate save file from your main save file, so you could have a speedrun going at the same time as your main gameplay, if you really wanted to. You can also quit and resume a speedrun, which actually is a relevant tactic for some speedruns. I may talk about that a little more later. Uh, there are leaderboards. I guess they work. I'm not on them. I don't know. So, I guess we get started here. Gonna start a new game. On normal. Uh, the only difference between normal and hard is basically how much damage you take and how much health the enemies have. It doesn't really affect gameplay, really. Uh, so, New Mexico. And it's snowing. Which is actually realistic. It does snow in New Mexico. It's high altitude in a lot of the state. In 
and we have some nicely pixelated pictures of a research lab. And someone named Trace really wants it to work. Uh, Trace, I'll let you know now, is the main character of the game. Uh, so that you know the term Trace, alongside the art meanings of it, uh, is used in programming to indicate a line of code you introduce into code to print debug output, basically. Uh, there's kind of an overall programming computer vibe to this game as the wall explodes into pixels. So I expect the developer used the term, the name Trace as a reference to that concept in programming. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for playing Axiom Verge. Oh wait, there's more. Okay. Suddenly everything's in 2D and there's a giant egg. And a mysterious voice wants us to go find a gun. With no further explanation. So, as always, it's a platformer. You jump around and run back and forth. In this case, this giant egg machine is our save point. Pretty dramatic for a save point, but it is what it is. Can we get to the top of the save point room? Nope. You can see the little mini-map at the top of the screen. You could actually see more above here, but you currently can't. And if you're like me, that'll probably bug you. We also can't go to the right now, so I guess we have to go to the left. The game wants us to teach us how to get things. So we need to jump over some obstacles. Is that our gun? Anything over here? Nothing over there. For now. Just so you know, don't bother trying to translate that text that flashes on the screen. As far as I can tell, it doesn't mean anything. And we receive the Axiom Disruptor. And the lights come on, and we get music. Before who finds me? But there are no answers to be had right now. So, the Axiom Disruptor should be pretty familiar to anyone who's ever played Metroid. Uh, there's obviously nothing in here you can shoot. One minor feature of this game is that you can press on a controller the uh, LB button. That locks you in place so you can aim in the diagonal directions without running around. It's actually pretty useful in a lot of places. And now we can't get back up there because the game wants us to learn that we can shoot the Norfair bubbles. Because of course it's a Metroidvania, it has to have Norfair bubbles. So I can jump impossibly high. Mysterious disembodied voices are telling me to find guns. I have save points. This can only mean I'm trapped in a video game. And these critters should look pretty familiar from Metroid 2. All they do is wander around on platforms all day until you blow them up, and sometimes they give you health. Doors are very familiar to Metroid, of course, as well. We go this way. Nope. Uh, so that you know, if you're playing along with me so you don't try to shoot everything, there are really only three types of damage in this game. Uh, weapon damage is one. Uh, if something isn't broken by one weapon, it's not going to be broken by any other weapon. Anything in here? Nope. That looks like a switch, but I sure can't shoot it with a gun that shoots in a straight line. What will we do? As for the other two types of damage that the game handles, we'll get to those later. Uh, 
That's what health pickups look like, by the way. And they do seek to you. That makes it a little easier to pick them up. Can't go up there either. Very similar type of gate. Things, by the way, are called Nautiluses by the game's wiki. And these huge, scary red things are called Hives. And they spawn those little wasps at you. Uh, the best thing to do in this area is just shoot them from a distance, because the wasps, if you get too close, will dive at you. I'll demonstrate like that. Actually, they don't dive, they just pause and shoot. They are placed in such a way that you can just stand here, kneel, and shoot at them. Uh, health pickups, there are a bunch of little particles. So in theory, you could get only part of a health pickup, but why? Let's see what's up here, anything? If I don't shoot the bubbles, I can use them to climb. And I encounter this squid thing that shoots lasers at me. Got it. What's that scary noise in the background that you can hear? Well, if you come up here, there's some scary stuff that prevents me from getting any further. If I jump up there and touch it, it actually damages me. So, that's not the way I'm supposed to go now, either. It's almost like the world's breaking down. What could that mean? Now, for this hive heart thing, if I can avoid the Nautilus. The best thing to do, stay up here, lock in place, and shoot it on the diagonal. And easy enough. It's gonna bypass those. So here we have one of those red switches that you can just shoot normally with your weapon, as you would expect. But there's a switch like that. That tells me I'm about to get the means to get through gates that look like that. It's not over there, though. So it can only be up here. Again, just to demonstrate, that gate does close behind... Okay, it doesn't close behind me, so I don't know why they bothered to put that there. If it did close behind me, I would need something else to get through there. I don't really need to take out each one of these, but... I am, anyway. This looks like different architecture. That sure looks like a Metroid item pickup. That looks like an item. Uh, that weird double axe motif that you see in the platform underneath, you will see used throughout the game to kind of denote item rooms and just generally types of architecture. Again, this type of architecture also has these honeycomb platforms, pillars, that kind of thing. You'll see this motif recur throughout the game, depending on who is assumed to have built the area in. Oh yeah, that's why the thing didn't respawn yet. Because this game does follow Metroid-style two-screen rule. Uh, the game will remember the state of the screen you just came from, but not the screen before that. So if you want to reset what's in a screen, you have to go two screens away from it. So in this case, the fact that the level design required us to do that and reset this gate, we now know that we need to use this new weapon we picked up, which explodes like that at an angle. So, by using that, we can hit things around a corner like that and open that type of gate. A uh, fair time to show the menu here, which I haven't done so far. Uh, we do have an in-game auto map. It fills in as we explore places. Uh, there are no Metroid-style map chambers. The only way to fill in the map is to actually go to the rooms. Uh, one thing you can do if you really wanted to, uh, you can set a reminder on a particular slot by using on the controller L and R. Clear those. That's if you saw something you couldn't get to with your current items, but you want to come back and check later. Uh, it's not really all that useful in my experience, but it's there. 
Uh, you'll also see there that we are in an er area called Erebu, not to be confused with Caribou. Uh, the term Erebu, according to the internet, is derived from the Sumerian word for to enter, this being the place where you enter the game, I guess. Uh, also, that little space to the left there, where it shows that funny pink shape, that's kind of showing the overall shape of the Erebu area, and later on how it relates to other areas in the game. That's kind of the equivalent of a world map in this game. Uh, let's see, inventory, we currently have two weapons, the original Axiom Disruptor and the Nova weapon. Uh, another thing you can do in this game is you can set hotkeys on different weapons, because there are a lot of weapons in this game. Uh, on the controller, you just click the sticks, and that allows you to use that stick click while exploring to change to that weapon. Right now, it's obviously kind of pointless because I only have two weapons. If I want to review the description of the weapon, I can do it like that, or of the item. It doesn't tell me yet what this is really for, but that is for in-game lore that you may accumulate over time later. What else do we have? That's all I can get to from here. Uh, I can also change my configuration in-game and exit, which I certainly don't want to do at this time. So, that's basically the menu. Uh, now, the Nova weapon is actually not very powerful relative to the Axiom Disruptor, so I'm going to be mainly using the Axiom Disruptor regardless. Through most of the game, really. While there are a lot of weapons... Uh, for the most part, none of them have the range of the Axiom Disruptor or the power. So I think for most cases, the Axiom Disruptor remains basically the best weapon to use, in my opinion. Except for some special case situations. So, we can't do anything with the weird, scary garbage in that room to the top, so I'm not going to bother going back over there. Not a speedrun, by the way, obviously. I'm kind of screwing around by trying to destroy every enemy sometimes, which is really unnecessary. Uh, I could go up there to the top left, but I'm not going to yet, because there is some other stuff I can do first. Ow. I didn't handle that very well, but okay. Let's see. This one, the middle door, however, I do want to go through now as I can using the Nova. And this takes us to another vertical passage. Now, note to the right there, those little purple pincers. If I trigger those, something scary happens, so watch out for those. The wiki calls that type of creature a scissor beak, for obvious reasons. Let's see, I believe if I go to the left here, this should be a save point. Uh, this game does also follow the Metroid rule that there are no items hidden in save rooms. Also, just so you know, you can't actually get to the top of this save room and look at it. There's nothing, no big secret hidden at the top of these things. I thought for a while there would be, but there's not. You just annoyingly have to come back and fill in the map on those rooms once you gain the ability to get up there on most of them. So, if I come over here, the music changes, and I see a weird spooky skull on the wall, and roaring. This is, throughout the game, going to be the way it signals that there's a boss fight coming up. Also, the red door to the right usually means boss time. Against some weird spherical scorpion tail thing that has us trapped. Okay. Game on!
Yes, they do talk in Dalek voices. I have decreed it. Demon, Athetos, say kill! Uh, all you really have to do against it is just stay underneath it around the platforms there. Just keep running back and forth. Uh, this boss is called Cedar, X-E-D-U-R. You would learn that from uh, the Steam achievement you get from killing it, as well as from the overlay on the speedruns. And really, this is all there is to it. It's just basically a way of teaching you to, or making sure you've learned how to freeze in place, because that's an important skill. And that's it. And bosses usually leave behind a giant field of health, which you really don't need, but I think it's just viscerally satisfying more than anything. Do we get an item from it? It looks like we do. Also in a Metroid-style egg case thing. The game actually does not use that egg case way of giving you items consistently. I think it just uses it in the early stages to get you familiarized with how this relates to Metroid gameplay. And we now have a laser drill, which we use with the right trigger. Uh, the laser drill is the second type of damage that I was talking about earlier. These gray rocks you cannot destroy with any weapon, but you can destroy them with the drill. So drill-type damage is kind of a separate tier of damage above weapon damage. Again, need to use the Nova to get through here. If I can aim properly. There it is. Uh, you can do damage with the drill to enemies. It's not really useful, but you can. And here, the game teaches you that sometimes walls you can drill through are not obvious. And we get our first power-up. This is a power node, which increases weapon and item damage. Which is generally a good thing, I suppose. And I think if you watch carefully, it took fewer shots to destroy the Nautilus that time. Yeah, again, I think it took three before, now it's taking two. Now they're not going to make me use the Nova. They know I've learned that by now. So now that I have the drill, I am actually going to go up to the top area here. Because now I can more or less explore that. Because as you see up there, there's some drill areas up there that I can't currently do anything with. Uh, if I come over here... I blast through a bunch more of these hive things. These Metroid reminiscent divey things. I don't remember what they call these on the wiki. Thing over here. A whole bunch of Norfair bubbles, which by the way, uh, drill damage damages these two. Anything drills can damage, or anything weapons can damage, drills can also damage, is what I'm trying to say. And here we get a size node, which makes the size of our weapon projectiles a little bit bigger. I can't really tell if that's the case or not. I'll take the game's word for it. So then I can come up here, now that I have the drill, do all this in one trip. Let's see. Nothing up there, but I can come through the door here. Pass through these green things. 
things. And then I come in here and there are a bunch more green things. I'm gonna just avoid most of them. And there is, up here, another weapon. This is the multi-disruptor. Now that I have multiple weapons, it would be possible for me to actually usefully do this. Uh, you can see there are more than two hotkeys there, the little numbers to the lower right of the icon. That would be relevant if I was using keyboard controls on, PS on PC. Uh, I'm not, so I only have the two hotkeys for the two thumbsticks. Uh, that's what the multi disruptor looks like. I don't really like it because it doesn't have the range, and I think the damage is less too. So I'm still basically going to be using the Axiom Disruptor. And here, you'll see there are more platforms over, over to the right. I can't jump that far. You can obviously see there's something up there. There's a door. I guess I'm just going to have to come back later with some other item. So let me see... Again, two screen rule, all these things are gone now. definitely be back there later. Have no worries. I will be getting every item in this game. I'll be showing you how to get the 100% items achievement. I will also be showing how to get the other 100% achievement, which we will be learning more about later. So that's all I can do up there for now, so let's continue over this way. Now that we can drill down here. There's nothing over here, by the way. We have another one of these vertical shafts. Not very long, though. And I see the scissors beat. We'll take that out before we come down here. Nothing over to the left there, no matter how tempting it looks to go look. It's just scissor beak death. Over there, you can see more of that scary, garbly stuff. Do not touch it. Let's see, anything over here? Funny seashell enemies. Uh, Spiru is what they're called in the wiki. And some other kind of garbly stuff. Uh, this is actually a different type of garbly stuff. You can touch it differently. Kind of the difference between flickering garbage tiles and just the mess. Uh, if you played NES games back in the day, you'll probably recognize that effect as what the NES tends to do when it glitches out and reads bad data or can't render sprites fast enough or something. Uh, nothing else in this shaft, so don't spend too much time looking around for it. Let me see. This way, we find this interesting ocean-looking area, but we can't jump high enough to get there. I guess we'll have to come back later. And that's the end of this shaft. Nowhere to go except down. over here. Just a room. I see some scissor beak. These happen to be red. They are different enemy types for what that's worth. 
and they do behave a little bit differently in ways that are not immediately apparent, but will be later. And there's an item up there, but just trust me on this, there is currently no way to get up there. Again, we'll have this obvious empty space on the map reminding us to come back later. So, the game wants us to come over here. As tempting as it is to pop every one of the Norfair bubbles, there's nothing in there. There is, however, an item just laying around on the ground, with the axe motif again, and that actually increases our health meter a little bit. And I believe health nodes do refill your health fully as well. And over here, if you look on the mini-map, there's not a, cor a door underneath us, there's an arrow. That tells us this is basically an elevator in Metroid terminology to another area. We are going to be leaving Erebu for a while. Where are we going instead? We'll have to find out next time. Thank you for watching, and good night. <laughs>